We are departing from the lectionary today to hear a parable from the Gospel of Luke that was read so well by Dory. The parable is about a man named Lazarus and an unnamed rich man. Lazarus is a beggar who sits at the gate of the rich man's house. We aren't told how long this arrangement has lasted, but we can assume it has been some time. Long enough, at least, for the two to know each other, or at least to know of each other. As fate would have it, both Lazarus and the rich man die on the same day. Lazarus is carried by angels to be with the ancestors, to be with Abraham. The rich man finds himself in Hades. And the two are separated in, the, in this afterlife of the parable, but they can see one another. The rich man can see Lazarus and Abraham. And so he calls out, Abraham, Abraham, please let Lazarus come and give me a drop of water for I am in agony. Abraham responds first by pointing out a reversal. My son, remember that you had comfort in life while Lazarus did not. Now, Lazarus has comfort while you do not. Abraham doesn't explicitly say this, but as listeners, we know that the rich man had the opportunity and the means to change this. The rich man could have comforted Lazarus in life, just as he wants Lazarus to comfort him now. Abraham goes on to say, besides, there is this great chasm between us that we cannot cross. The rich man takes this in and he calls out again, Abraham, then please, please send Lazarus to warn my family. I don't want them to end up like me. To which Abraham says, they have Moses. They have the prophets, they have the scriptures, they know what God requires of them. If they do not listen to the word of God, then I don't think a ghost will change their mind. The point of the parable is rather clear, right? We as followers of Jesus are called to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, liberate the captive and comfort the poor. This isn't the first time we've heard it. This isn't the first time I've preached it. I imagine that we, like the rich man, have heard this message time and time again. So the question is not whether we get the point of the parable. The question is whether it changes anything. I got a call Thursday morning from a reporter at the Hyde Park Herald. She's working on a story that will be published next week about a man named Sam Harvard. She told me that Mr. Harvard died in the cold a couple of weeks ago outside one of our neighboring church buildings. I can't say that I knew Mr. Harvard well, but he used to sleep behind our church building. He was a patron of the food pantry, and I believe he was friends with people in the neighborhood. I remember the first time I met him. I introduced myself as one of the pastors. He looked a little surprised by that. It surprises people sometimes that I'm a pastor. I think it's because I look quite young and I'm a woman and I'm maybe not, you know, the distinguished bearded gentleman people might expect when you say the word pastor. 
Mr. Harvard and I laughed about that. I said, yeah, believe it or not, I'm, I'm one of the pastors. I offered him some water, some snacks. I asked if there were services he needed and Elicum and Norman helped me get him a few bus passes. A couple of summers ago, we had a difficult conversation with Mr. Harvard. Some of you may remember this. He had been storing personal belongings and food in the window wells along the side of the building. Unfortunately, some of the food began to spoil and it created an infestation problem. Several of us spoke with Mr. Harbert about the need to clean out the window wells. And eventually the church hired a company to remove these items. I hadn't seen Mr. Harvard in some time. And I'll admit that I hadn't thought much about him lately. I assumed that he had moved to a different location in the city or maybe even had moved to a different city entirely. That call from the reporter broke my heart. After I got off the phone, I, I called my friend Ellie, who is a pastor out in Seattle. I needed a pastor. Sometimes your pastors need pastors. I needed someone to give me some space to process and to cry. I needed pastoral care. And when I was out of tears, she said, Sarah, you know you have to preach about it, right? And I said, you mean I have to preach from the pain? And she said, yeah. And I said, yeah, Ellie, I know, I know. I am mature enough to know that our church's decision about Mr. Harvard's belongings did not cause his death. Yet I'm also mature enough to name our failure, our community, this one in our wider neighborhood and our still wider city collectively failed Mr. Harvard. And that breaks my heart. And it should break my heart. I think of the hymn, Let Your Heart Be Broken. It's a hymn that has always, for me, spoken to my calling as a Christian and as a pastor. You might know it. It goes, let your heart be broken for a world in need. Feed the mouths that hunger. Soothe the wounds that bleed. Give the cup of water and the loaf of bread. Be the hands of Jesus serving in his stead. Last week, I preached from 1 Corinthians, the text where Paul describes the church as the body of Christ. It tells us that we are the body, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. But so was Mr. Harvard. Mr. Harvard was the hands and feet and body of Jesus. Matthew 25, 44 through 45 says, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And Jesus says, truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. You did not do it to me. The body of Jesus was in our neighborhood and we did not take care of him. A neighborhood with over 20 churches, that should break our hearts. The parable of Lazarus and the rich man imagines this chasm in the afterlife. Yet we live with such a great chasm here and now. This chasm that separates rich and poor, housed and unhoused. 
this chasm wherein one could spend an entire day in Hyde Park without ever knowing that homelessness is here. I love parables, I do, but I worry sometimes that they make us a little too comfortable, that we find a way to let ourselves off the hook. We distance ourselves from the rich man in the parable, perhaps because we're not millionaires or billionaires or corporate tycoons. Yet most of us here today, most of us, I think, are closer to the rich man than to Lazarus. I am. I don't have a gatehouse or a private plane, but I have more money in my bank account than most people. When a third of the global population lives on less than $2 a day, most of us are closer to the rich man than to Lazarus. When almost 60,000 people in Chicago are without shelter, most of us are closer to the rich man than to Lazarus. My friends, I worry that we are too comfortable with parables and I worry that we are too comfortable with chasms. The chasm that separated Lazarus and the rich man is the same chasm that separated our community from Mr. Harvard. So we can't let ourselves off the hook. Not today. The parable teaches us that wealth creates a chasm. Is money evil in and of itself? No, not necessarily. It is the reality of the world we live in right now. We need to buy food, right? We need to pay medical bills. And we all deserve to be comfortable and to experience nice things. But that's the key, right? We all deserve that. We all deserve that, regardless of the degree you earn or who your parents are or any identity you hold. We all deserve to be safe. My God, we all deserve to be warm. We all deserve to be fed and housed. We all deserve to flourish just because we are, full stop. Wealth creates a chasm because it is seductive. It is so easy for wealth to become an idol. It is so easy for the pursuit of success to become the pursuit of wealth, to become the pursuit of more and more and more. It is so easy for wealth and privilege to insulate us, to literally make suffering invisible to us until we have a society where there is this great chasm that we cannot seem to cross. The parable teaches us that it does not have to be this way. Lazarus did not have to sit as a beggar at the gate. The rich man did not need quite so many luxuries. Perhaps the chasm did not need to exist at all. It is a hard thing to fail someone. It is a hard thing to know that our love, our resources, our time, our efforts can fall short. I know that for me at least, the chasm can be so overwhelming that I feel hopeless. Church, I felt a little hopeless on Thursday morning. But then, Oh, then I remembered Jesus. I remembered this amazing promise that I don't have to be enough. That we don't have to be enough. This promise that we can fail individually and collectively and receive grace. And that gives me strength to try again. It gives me strength to cross the chasm. I believe very truly that Mr. Harvard is with the ancestors. 
I pray that he rests in peace and comfort and power. I thank him for the moments that we shared and I ask for forgiveness for the moments we did not share. Mr. Harvard's story is not a parable. He did not live and die to teach us a lesson. And yet his story illuminates this great chasm. Does anything change now that we see it? Will you pray with me? Oh God, let your grace fall on us. Let your grace fall on us. We are not perfect. We make mistakes. We fail to feed you and clothe you and comfort you sometimes. But God, your grace and your love encourages us to try again. Give us eyes to see this chasm that is before us. Give us hands to build a bridge. Give us bravery to walk across. Knowing that that is how your kingdom comes. That is how your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Through the work of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.